This is lecture number six for Philosophy 220, our study of ethics. And in this lecture, we're looking at teleological or consequentialist moral theories. We'll begin here with someone that uh, your textbook did not mention. Uh, as a matter of fact, there weren't many um, personal examples given of the eth ethical egoists. So uh, here you have the novelist Ayn Rand, who is known for holding um, a philosophy known as objectivism, uh, which insists that you do not look to any sort of uh, uh, afterlife or do not turn to uh, intuition, uh, instincts, feelings about things to determine what is uh, in existence. But instead, objectivism says you objectively look out in the world and you use your senses uh, to determine what actually exists. And as part of that larger uh, philosophy of objectivism, Ayn Rand also was an ethical egoist, uh, presenting in her uh, novel, her most well-known novel would be Atlas Shrugged, presenting this concept of objectively uh, looking at our own lives. We ultimately do what is best uh, for us as individuals. And that's going to be a very important distinction you'll need to make between ethical egoism and a uh, utilitarian approach to moral theory. Utilitarians look at community as a whole. Ethical egoists look simply to the own individual's good. I do need you to be careful to draw an important distinction between ethical egoism and selfishness, though. Your textbook does a fine job on this. Uh, ethical egoists are not necessarily uh, behaving in every action selfishly because an ethical egoist may realize that in making some sort of sacrifice or not doing what gives them the greatest pleasure in the moment might actually turn out in the long term a better for them. So again, make sure you don't equate ethical egoism with selfishness because again, in the moment, Sometimes you may not do what is best for you because you can foresee an outcome later on uh, that would be good. Uh, ethical egoism, uh, like most of uh, the moral theories that are teleological, can be either based in actions uh, or based on rules. Okay, So the action in and of itself or over time you can develop rules uh, that you uh, act by that will usually result in the greatest good for you. You realize a particular pattern over time, so you establish a rule that will re result in great good for you. Also, ethical egoism, we're going to say much more about this on the next slide, ethical egoism tends to be dismissive and doubtful about genuine acts of altruism. Okay, Very doubtful that any sort of action you or I could perform is genuinely out of, um, I think the phrase, the goodness of our heart, that that sort of concept does not exist within ethical uh, egoism, but, it, but is instead a fabrication. Okay, one thing tied very closely to ethical egoism is psychological egoism. Um, the, the minority of philosophical ethicists who actually do adopt this approach, this moral theory called ethical egoism, uh, believe that humans are incapable of acting non-egotistically. That even when it looks like we are doing something kind for someone else or making a sacrifice, our real motive is actually uh, some sort of reward or something good for us. The example that I always use here is to say that I'm in the Food Lion parking lot and I see an elderly woman who's having trouble getting her groceries uh, to her car. And I'm, I'm busy, uh, don't have the time to help her, but out of the corner of my eye I see a colleague or I see a student watching me to see what I'm going to do. So I do help the woman get her groceries to her car even though I'm very busy, but my motive wasn't really to help her, but it was so that the person who's watching me uh, would think better of me. So even though it looked like I was perhaps on the outside doing something selfless, I was really behaving selfishly. Uh, the psychological egoism insists that even these supposed acts of sacrifice or selflessness are actually grounded, again, in much deeper and bigger selfish desires. When it comes down to it, it really is uh, all about you. Okay, now again, it's a, it's a vast minority within philosophical ethics, uh, those who hold this ethical egoism approach. But there are, however, many utilitarians. Uh, pictured at the bottom right here is the gentleman that I introduced you to last week, uh, John Stuart Mill. Uh, the generation uh, prior to John Stuart Mill, we had really our earliest utilitarian, official utilitarian approach to ethics. That was Jeremy Bentham, who's pictured here uh, at the top part of the slide. Now, let me tell you something that these two utilitarians had in common and then uh, demonstrate to you a major difference between them. 
Uh, both men argued that the greatest moral good comes in the actions that provide the most happiness. Okay, that's your, your key word for utilitarian ethics is this idea of happiness. As abstract or vague as that term may be, I mean, who's going to define what happiness is? This is, this is very uh, important to a utilitarian. So whatever action is going to have the consequence of the most happiness, uh, that is what the proper ethical decision would be. And again, it's not just for the individual, but it's for everyone involved. So you would look at all the different approaches you could take in an ethical dilemma of how the dilemma could be solved or what your answer could be about what is good or what is right. And almost like doing a mathematical equation, you try to somehow quantify happiness. Again, this is very difficult. You try to quantify uh, happiness and see what stacks up with the most units of happiness is, however you're going to measure that. And whichever uh, one comes out with the most units of happiness, that would be the best solution to your ethical dilemma. Now, one thing that you need to be aware of, uh, many are critical of the utilitarian theory here, is that it does not matter to most utilitarians how that happiness is spread out. So let's say you have 100 people involved in the ethical dilemma, and you end up with uh, 1,000 units of happiness. Again, however you're going to quantify that, it does not mean that that's equally distributed of 100 uh, for each person. Uh, but instead, uh, you could have one person receive uh, 900 and all the others just to get to divvy up what is remaining. So whatever the best possible outcome is, it's the total number of happiness, but not necessarily uh, equally spread out over those involved. Now, Bentham defined uh, happiness in a very broad way. Whatever makes one happy, whatever brings uh, one pleasure, whatever kind of pleasure that may be, whether it's a physical pleasure, emotional pleasure, all, all of that is happiness and all to be understood the same and quantified the same. Uh, John Stuart Mill sort of arbitrarily divided uh, between what he called higher levels of happiness and lower levels of happiness. And uh, the things that were related more to physical pleasure, whether it's the, the buzz that you would get from a few shots of vodka or whether it would be some sort of sexual liaison, uh, Mill uh, called those the lower forms of pleasure, that in the immediate moment they may make you happy, but the happiness will be fleeting and not lasting, as is the happiness with the higher uh, forms. And so uh, the, the higher forms, again, tend to tie us more into what we would consider uh, virtues, particular actions that bring in a long-lasting uh, sort of happiness through an act of kindness that we could do. Even if it calls for sacrifice in the moment, the kindness will produce a happiness uh, that is lasting. And so uh, we're going to say more about that term virtue uh, next week. I'm really glad your author included a final chapter in moral theory on virtue because that really is where most moral theorists are moving today. Uh, let me digress just a moment here. Uh, we certainly do have a lot of ethicists that are primarily dealing in the Kantian approach of non-consequential or deontological ethics that we looked at last week. And we certainly have many moral theorists that are still operating in a, in a John Stuart Mill sort of utilitarian framework. But really, modern day, present day moral theorists have uh, begun to try to take what is good from each of these schools of thought and have begun moving into a uh, third and what will be a final approach for us, uh, virtue ethics. And so th that's what we have to look forward to next week. Okay, uh, also uh, utilitarians are not all action-based, although the vast majority are. Uh, there are rule-based utilitarians, and I, I personally find this the most uh, interesting and intriguing approach to uh, utilitarian forms of uh, moral theory. Um, again, the action-based does not try to establish any sort of rule or law after examining a pattern that takes place uh, in moral decision-making, but only looks at the actions themselves. Uh, the rule-based utilitarians are seeking a more objective approach because they, they do realize how subjective an action-based or act-based utilitarianism would be, that uh, you're simply looking at an action and you are subjectively quantifying uh, this happiness, and as you go from situation to situation, uh, you can, again, very subjectively just sort of change uh, how you quantify happiness uh, or how you evaluate the consequences. And so, again, rule-based is trying to look at what happens uh, with your actions and observing the consequences 
and over a period of time try to establish a pattern and from that pattern you then form rules or laws that tell you generally when you have this action uh, this is the consequence that produces the most happiness so again trying to give you a way to evaluate establish a pattern and uh, help you in a utilitarian approach uh, make the right or good decision now the main thing that you need to see with rule-based utilitarian approach is that these are never black and white simple rules there are always amendments and exceptions being added because every time the action takes place in a new environment uh, you see uh, some different variables come into making that decision so let's just take as an example here that uh, we say it's uh, very important that people have uh, personal freedom okay so let's say that we begin with that as our black and white rule it is important and good that people have personal freedom okay th then we run into issues well if people have personal freedom they get to do whatever they want uh, what if that action brings harm to someone else and so wonderful uh, example here of a rule-based utilitarian approach you take your beginning rule it is a good thing a right thing for people to have personal freedom but now we have to amend it but that personal freedom must be limited so that one cannot cause harm uh, to someone else and so we see this today with uh, let's say you're gonna uh, smoke a cigarette there would be certain places you can't do that because uh, the smoke would get into someone else's uh, environment and they would uh, that would make them unhappy so you're violating their personal freedom and so the utilitarian would say you still have the personal freedom to smoke but it would only be in a particular environment um, also, the example that I give you here on the slide is I do come from the state of Texas where uh, we have very strict seatbelt laws. I've been told in Virginia they cannot pull you over for not wearing your seatbelt, but if they pull you over for some other offense and they see you not wearing a seatbelt, you can get a ticket. Uh, well, in Texas, they can actually just be looking for the seatbelt violation and pull you over and give you a ticket. So I, I would say just... Um, from uh, my own moral theory here that that would seem to break our rule that we just did people should be allowed to have personal freedom okay that means I should have the right to choose not to wear a seatbelt unless uh, I exercise that personal freedom to cause harm to someone else now my not wearing a seatbelt could certainly cause harm to me but how is it going to cause harm to someone else I don't I don't think this measures up and someone could certainly argue against me if we want to look at the other side and say well uh, if what if you are killed in a car accident car wreck what does this do to your uh, family what does this do to your friends and they're they're grieving but that really would be a stretch to the rule uh, based on this utilitarian approach and so um, I, 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 as far as the act-based utilitarianism goes it can be very subjective I hope everyone's hearing that but the rule-based utilitarian approach does give you at least a greater sense of trying to get some objectivity here okay and so that concludes us